shuttle. Actually, this is what I wanted to talk about this morning, but with the specs that we heard yesterday, this instrument, as nice as it is in forensics, will not do the job. Even if we would do modifications on it, it will not do the job. I made this black box microscope there called Shuffle. Um, Leica is famous for its optics, but we will need some help in that project when it comes to the tape, foil, and I will show you later on some pictures I took on, on tapes and the implications that they have on optics and some types of analysis. So then we heard yesterday 2 micron lateral resolution, which actually <clears throat> has an impact also on the Z resolution because we need to use a certain numerical aperture to get that lateral resolution, which then limits down the vertical resolution as well. We also heard the sample size up to A4. And I'll come to that later. Then we should have transmitted light, eventually with polarization, fluorescence and spectroscopy. And that gives me a little bit of a headache. So talking of our two micron lateral resolution has some <clears throat> relatively big implications. I've been looking up some data from one of our objectives that does the 500 line pairs, which is actually the two micron resolution that is requested. If we do that, and then calculate from what the camera sees. To scan an A4 tape in one layer would require, with a big thumb calculation, 14,000 single images. The size of these images, of course, then depend what resolution has the camera. So in how many pixels we take that, if we take it with 8-bit or 16-bit, depth of color. So there, there is a lot of implication in terms of file size also. And just to actually thicker, up to I don't know what. Then you require also Z-stacking, which then multiplies the 14,000 times the layers of Z-stacking. And that will create very, very huge files. So to handle these files will be also beyond what, what we can handle with our software. Then, image analysis, we are relatively good in that Leica Microsystems, respectively Cambridge Instruments, which is now part of Leica Microsystems, invented image analysis. So that particle detection and saying, okay, this is a fiber, this is a spot, it has this and this color, this is all doable. But again, doing that on a large scale, instead of just the particles that are of interest, has also some huge implications. And then there is also that request to refine the particle. On an A4 scale, you would have to put your sample in exactly the same position so that the scanning stage could go back to that particle of which we know the coordinates. So that has other technical implications. It also has technical implications in terms of the scanning stage used. At the moment, there is no scanning stage that comes to my mind with a high enough precision of what you need if you want to find your small particles again that can cover an A4. So, another obstacle. And the database, just having talked about potential dimensions of the image files with the potential to actually uh, catalog the particles individually, if I understood that right from yesterday, and to then compare this to particles from another scan would require a real huge database. But really, really huge because our images that we put in and the number of particles 
uh, goes up extremely fast. I don't know how many particles you expect on an A4. Somebody might help me with that. But just cataloging one single scan then will require enormous computing capacities as well. Okay, let's come to some pictures. Actually, that is a part of my carpet at home. In a tape, and then <clears throat> I actually use the DVM6 for that. And that's already a scan. And scan dimensions, if I remember well, is something like six, seven centimeters times four centimeters or so. That is relatively fast, but that's not at your requested resolution. So that would be one single image out of that XY scan. Um, and this is done without polarization. So this is just simple transmitted light. And this is now with a pole foil underneath the sample and cross-polarized light. And we are on the boundary between where the foil is, the tape is. So this darker background part is where there is no tape. And the yellowish background part is the part where the tape is. And it should be actually black in the background, or as dark as it can be. So the foil or the tape itself should have no polarizing qualities, which, which actually, again, as I said, that's not a Leica problem. That's a problem for whoever produces the tape. But you see here what implication the tape has. And to make things worse, here you have again an overview image. And guess what? For those of you who do microscopy, this is a lambda plate. And normally the lambda plate in a polarized light image should look magenta colored and not yellow. And this is just the fact that the tape itself has a huge effect on polarization. <coughs> so I guess none of you want that. Again, this has lots of implication when it comes to the microscope. So here again, you have a part, non-polarized light, and that's one single shot out of that scan that we had before. And we've tried something that I cannot talk about, but what you get out of that is that kind of image. So we were actually using something that we just tested for another purpose to get a fluorescence effect. But this is not classical fluorescence with a cube where you have an excitation and an emission filter. So just to summarize that, A4 will need for a single scan something like 14,000 single images at the resolution you want. You will require eventually set stacking of I don't know how much, depending on how big the particles are that are in that foil package or in the tape package. We have a problem with polarization here that, again, we cannot solve. We need something that is non-polarizing. And we will very likely run into a very, very huge amount of data, which then is for whoever will take care of the database part. Because I, c I can tell you that these dimensions of databases we will not be able to handle. This is not a miracle. This is really, we discussed that, Tomas and I, yesterday. This is really huge data handling, which is beyond what we normally have in a microscope. 
I haven't yet talked about the spectroscopy part because I still believe that this makes in a scan world not really sense because you should then choose the parts that are really interesting for spectroscopy and do that separately as you said you would do Grimm and Raman and these kind of things separately. I still believe that the spectroscopy part should be taken out. And before I finish, now I have some questions that you will be maybe able to answer or maybe in the, uh, in the request for information. Uh, I can tell you, when I report back from this meeting, I will be asked to build up a, bu a business case. And the business case in our world means how much have you in mind should be the price of an instrument that can do everything you want and about how many instruments are we talking in which time frame because that are questions that I will be asked and I hope I can bring back from here some answers and if not I hope I can find them from your side so that was that was that short summary what I prepared this morning because as I said I had something completely different in mind but with that information I got yesterday I think this summarizes the instrument part at least the optical instrument part relatively nicely so thank you yeah. And I hope you're not too disappointed about the numbers I was just bringing up here. So, thanks again. Uh, just to bounce back on when you said about the business case, um, there's a question about, obviously, the price of an instrument, also the question about the uh, intellectual property, who belongs, um, who, uh, well, to whom it would belong to, like the, the IP, effectively. Exactly and uh, patterns involved, etc., etc., etc. These are all questions that either our salespeople or our R&D people or our uh, IP people will be asking. Uh, I have another question on pure curiosity, really. You said what, when you have a thick, some, um, a thick particle, you, no, you need to do some Z-stacking. Is it possible to do just some Z-stacking at the point where the particle is actually thick, not everywhere? I, I think that will be extremely difficult. What we, can, what, what we have with motorized focus levels, we could also tell the system, OK, do me an autofocus for each and every uh, every part of the scan. Uh, what happens then if it stitches that together is an interesting question. It's going to look strange. Uh, I have never tried that. What, what I can tell you is that if we would go with, let's say, half the resolution or three times the resolution number, so six, ten microns or so, things will be much easier. That's for sure. Because I still then can increase depth of field. I lose a little bit in lateral resolution, but I gain enormously in depth of field. But the moment I have to do Z-stacking on that number of, of images and then just think the algorithm that produces the Z-stack multifocus image actually has to align pixels. Doing that with 14,000 <laughs> images, each, let's say, with a resolution of 2 megapixel. Um, <clears throat> we're running here in, into massive computing issues. And it's not only us, it will be everybody. <laughs> Because th that, that, that kind of stacking is, on that amount of image, is not, not easy. Other questions?
can we imagine the process in two steps? A low resolution step to, to have a sort of an image of the, the, of the A4 uh, tape and then sort of refine with high resolution? Is it? Yeah, that's, that's actually one of the things I hope somebody would ask that. That, that is what I would do from a practical point of view because you have the, the whole area scanned in low res and then go to the real points of interest and analyze them much deeper. That, that would be an option. But again, it, it really depends where you put your limits and what you want to get out of it. But I, I think it is also my kind of, of duty to, to focus you a bit on the technical aspects, you know. Dreaming is very nice, uh, unless the dreaming turns out to be a nightmare. Yeah, it's even nice to, be, to get paid for dreaming, but that's even nicer. That's, yeah, but, but getting paid for a nightmare afraid, is not so good. I'm really afraid I made a kind of stupid mistake uh, looking at your presentation. Talking to customers, you always see that, uh, and that, that might uh, relieve things with a factor of two. Um, I used the term spatial resolution, but I might have been that I actually meant the pixel size, which is, of course, a factor two difference. Th that that's a very big difference. That's yes, a very big difference. that's a very big and difference. I think but I made a because long for, time ago but, in my head, but for, and I never for for a two micron lateral resolution, you actually need eight pixels. Yeah. No. I o think on the I other hand, looking at some microscopes that I have installed in the hair and fiber yeah. particle world. And how many people actually work with magnifications, 20 times objective, 40 times objective. Some people even work up with 100 times objective. Here we are talking sub-micron resolutions then. So what that calculation yeah. was based no, on I think that was is a 10x objective. That's stupid of mine. I think that will be corrected then in the specification that you will receive. Um, what I meant is um, we are uh, looking into traces that might be as small as 10 microns, 12 microns, and you don't want... Okay, that, that, that changes the dimension yeah. drastically. You don't want in a single trace a single pixel, you want some overkill there. Um, but on a fiber of maybe 8, 10 microns, you will need 3, 4 pixels. So that's a pixel size of maybe 2. Uh, but then you don't get sharp borders. I can already tell you that. <laughs> so, that's, that's, well, that's, that's, let's let's not discuss the type of camera that we are using. It's then that's that's no. a secondary thing. I would never use, for example, a 10 megapixel camera for things like that, because that takes <laughs> ages. And I also would not use 16-bit color depth, because that increases the file size tremendously. It's, I've, I've, I've yeah. done that just recently with a 16-bit camera, and I just compared yeah. the file size of an eight of the 8-bit image to the file size of the 16-bit image, and it multiplies a couple of times. Should be factor two, but <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um. So in, in, instead of having 200. 56 colors you have then, yes, a couple of thousands. So, uh, and, and that makes file size wise a very, very huge difference. <laughs> and especially it's what, what I have in mind for, for shuttle is really the first step. And I'm very happy that that question was asked if we then come back and look at part particles that really are of interest and then go deeper into them. Yeah. That, that makes a huge difference for, for me already. We'll see what happens. Yeah. That's something I also had in mind. We discussed that already yesterday. Um, since we have so many 
different particles on the tape lifts, I think we need at least a two-phase uh, attempt or, or approach, uh, just to reduce the number of um, yes, particles of interest to avoid an overload of data, and uh, so information we cannot handle anymore. Yeah, and especially when, when it comes to that part, if I understood that right, to compare particles from different lifts, because that then multiplies the number of data <laughs> in the database enormously. If you would take every single particle that you have on that A4 lift, that would overflow a database very, very fast. And then with the amount of data to then start the comparison and link two particles from two different lifts together, I'm not sure about that. If, if you have 100,000 particles on a tape, which is quite a big number, you have 100,000 sets of um, properties. Yep. For a database, that's not that much. No, it's not just 100,000 uh, sets of data because uh, so particles are longer than the image you take. Of course, yeah, but, but for, before you enter it into a database, if you have a, a, a trace of one square millimeter, a very big trace, you don't enter every pixel of that, that sample into the database. No, you say, no, well, no, no. this you, is the you trace end, we do you in enter the process, in the database. this is a trace as a unity, and I subtract, I extract some, some summarizing data from that trace and put a summary yeah, into but, the database. But still, you have dimensional data, you have uh, color point data, etc., etc., etc. So you have a whole set of data. Of course. And not just once. Because I know that because we have long experience, for example, in the automotive industry where we use a thing called cleanliness expert, which does particle analysis. But the sheer amount of data is what still shocks me. Any other questions? No, but, uh, I'm unsure if it's feasible. If it's not feasible, then it's obviously not feasible. Um, uh, but that's you probably have to discuss that with the guy behind you. <laughs> He's the one for large data numbers. Oh, good, good. <laughs> uh, okay. If it's not feasible, then we'll have to choose something that is feasible, of course. Um, the, the big advantage of a, a brute force, measure everything, grasp later what you think is interesting, would be that you can use data sets as background for further cases. So we did already 10 cases, the, the sets are in the, in the database. We do an 11th case and say, how special is that? Does this happen more often, these kind of phrases? Well, look through the earlier cases. cases. I, I know the, exactly what you mean, because and, it sounds and, so familiar from and if you, ballistics comparison. If, if you beforehand uh, select, well, this is interesting, this is interesting, this is interesting, but this is not interesting, you s throw them out and you lose them. So I'm very big fan of brute force. I look very peaceful, but I'm big fan of brute force. But if it's not feasible, it's not feasible. Um, you spoke about the, the polarization problem of the tape. Um, the, the tape is produced linearly, so normally you have a sort of biaxial polarization of the material, is it possible eventually to choose a tape and a foil and to plug the tape in the other direction and to have a sort of, of cross-polar case in, in, in the combination of the tape and, and, the, and the foil and to have a, a darker background? Good, good question. I yes, don't know. Question, but that, this solution. is a very good question. That, that's, uh, we discussed possible. that yesterday uh, with, that's, with that's uh, the, the Greek colleagues. I don't know. <laughs> okay. yeah. But there are solutions for that. Uh, we've patented that. <laughs> yeah, but we'll talk about we'll it. Talk, we've patented that idea. <laughs> so, uh, but we'll talk about it later. Any other? If not, thanks again for your attention. And I hope I get the answers that I was asking somewhere. So how many units, what price you have in mind, things like that to build up a business case. Thanks again.